started last time on trying to introduce abilities into the analysis, and it's, I think it's very important to do so. You know, I'm going to use a single dimension of abilities. Obviously, abilities has many components. We talk about cognitive abilities, but even within the cognitive abilities category, there are different forms of cognitive ability. Some people have, have very good spatial visualization. Others don't. Some people then do a lot of mathematical calculations and others, others don't. And, and you can go on and on. So, a lot of them. Some are non-cognitive. There are many forms of non-cognitive abilities. Um, it's less systematized in the cog cognitive ability uh, area. You know, with, uh, do you do your homework? Or in an organized fashion. Now, you're a well-organized person. We know there are people who are really extremely well-organized and others who are completely disorganized. Uh, uh, um, Rick, I, you look like you're an organized guy, but I won't say who looks like they're disorganized, but uh, people vary a lot in, in this characteristic. Um, and. You know, some, uh, people, some people, and partly related to that, they're always working hard at the last minute to finish a paper. Other people have it ready, you know, days or even weeks ahead of time. Uh, some people are always late for appointments. Others are early. So people differ a lot in these things. Even now, some of them are genetic. Uh, I believe a, a lot of characteristics are genetic, but a lot of them are either environmentally alone or interact with the genetic component. So that's why it's been so difficult to, um, for, for just extensive literature that goes back hundreds of years to try to sort out what's due to genetics and what, what isn't. Although we're learning now there are uh, genes and uh, that, uh, that if you sort of mess around with these genes, they will have clear effects on memory and other forms of behavior. So the, the old view that was prominent in the early part of the 20th century, that everything is environmentally determined, that's complete nonsense. Uh, on the other hand, there is a view now among uh, some behavioral psychologists and others that everything is completely genetics. I think that's also uh, entirely wrong. So I think there's a lot of interaction between genetics and environment. Um, and uh, exactly where, we don't know. And I'm not going to really try to solve that question. I, I, I can solve it. Um, so what I'm simply going to assume is that we have a, s a single dimension of abilities, and they get fixed uh, at the beginning of a, ch a, a person's life, okay? or very early in their person's life. Okay? Work by Heckman and, and co-authors suggests that cognitive abilities get fixed earlier than non-cognitive. And the cognitive gets fixed pretty early in life. Maybe it's mainly because it's mainly due to genetics. Uh, but non-cognitive uh, uh, gets determined later. Although once people are, say, seniors in high school, they're not well organized, they're unlikely to become well organized later on. I mean, they can't accomplish a lot, but they accomplish it in a disorganized way, let's put it that way. Um, now, how are we going to bring it? Why is abilities relevant for us? Well, it's relevant because, mainly because it affects the investments in human capital. It affects human capital accumulation. It's relevant because it's, it's a significant determinant of inequality and of intergenerational mobility within a, a, a cross family. So we have two different measures that we continue to stress. Inequality, let's say, within a generation or a cohort. So what we ordinarily mean by inequality, what's the distribution of earnings, let's say, in the United States, maybe adjusted for people in present value of earnings or for a given age or some other measure like that. And then uh, there's another measure of inequality. How much do families mix up over time? Do the same families stay on top and the same families stay on the bottom or do they mix a lot? 
Now, both of those are affected by abilities. We'll show them. We'll give an integrated, although it's quite simple model of both determinants of inequality. And the way we will we'll bring in abilities, and abilities is important for the, is to say, well, now we have this production function, let's take it children. That depends on how much is invested in children. It depends on parental human capital. But now we'll say it also depends on the ability of the child. Okay? And we'll assume that D, F, dA equals f of a is greater than zero. So when you're more able, you get more human capital out of given other inputs, that namely parental human capital and uh, y expenditures and goods of time on children. And generally, we'll also assume also that f of y k is greater than equal to zero. So that if you're more able, the marginal product of investments in you is higher. Uh, clearly, the second derivative doesn't follow from this first derivative necessarily, but we're going to make that seems like a, a plausible assumption. If you have a higher IQ, uh, you do uh, it, it, you know you, if you go to more schooling, you, the productivity of going to college is greater for the higher IQ than for low. At the extremes, that's clearly going to be true. You know whether you, how how smooth it is and steep. <coughs> In the middle parts of this, uh, uh, I don't know. Okay. Maybe it's also, I, I'm not going to do much about F of H, A, so that's probably also positive, but I'm not going to say much about that. So if, if the marginal product of parental human capital is greater on the more able children. Maybe that isn't true, but uh, I'm not going to really uh, use any sign on that. Okay. So think of that A, uh, you know, your parents, you have a child, you observe their A and you decide on why. Now, yeah, well, that's clearly that's an abstraction. <coughs> Parents don't completely observe their A. I mean, every parent thinks they have a genius. <laughs> <laughs> At least until the kids reach a certain age where the evidence becomes overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so that may, that's maybe relevant, uh, that parents overestimate the kids' abilities. Some parents may underestimate the kids' abilities. Sometimes you don't learn the abilities for a number of years. You see them, you know, you have to see how they respond. You think they're really good or not so good, and then you see they accomplish a lot. So you, you, you affect it. Um, a lot of what I would say, so I'm, but I'm going to assume that parents see uh, the actual ability of the child. Maybe they only see the expected ability of the child. <coughs> maybe they have other uh, Bayesian estimates, maybe even on, maybe biased estimates. One could modify a lot of what I'm going to say, but the <coughs> simplest assumption, or, or a simple assumption, is that they see actually see A of C. An alternative simple assumption is they see the expected A of C. All right? And that's what they go on. That's, that would be simple. Uh, actually, it's more simple in some respects than what I'm going to assume. Uh, but I'm going to assume they actually see the C, uh, A of C. You might say, well, maybe you don't see it right away, but maybe at early years of investment, you're going to do more or less the same thing for, for your child within a very broad range of what their ability is. It won't make that much difference. It's only later on that it makes a difference. By that time, let's say you observe their ability. That's one way to rationalize assumption I'm making without necessarily assuming you see the ability right away. Okay? So what ability does then is both raise H of C directly, right? And maybe it raises it indirectly by affecting y. That's what we have to consider. Right? Those are two ways it, it can have an effect, direct and indirect. And we'll show it as it'll tend to have both effects, uh, although it does, it's not 
is they going to be true that y goes up when ability goes up, but the, there will be there will be an, in general an effect on y. Okay. Now, if we ask what's the effect of observing a high ability of children on on the, on what parents do. The answer should be pretty straightforward. Eric Nielsen, where's he? Yeah, yes. Right. What would be the effect of it? So let's say you increase the child's ability. All the parents are in capital. Everything about the parents constant. Right. Um, What's the, what would you think would be the effect? Well, if you've assumed that the marginal productivity of investing is increasing in the ability of the child and the parents are altruistic, you would think that the parent would choose to increase water. Okay. Um, you know why? Not, I'm sorry, why? W-H-Y, not why. Why, <laughs> why does that happen? Um, now remember, we divide everything into income and substitution. Right. So that's not overcomplicated. That's what we have. What's the income effect? On Y. The income effect on Y is. Let's say kids are more able. Right. Parents have more income. Right. What are they? And they, here's a parent's income constraint. Right. Parents so have more utility. That would decrease Y. All right. So we already have a force decreasing Y. So right. that would so suggest that you can't really be sure. It's ambiguous. Yeah. What's the, no, okay, that's the, so the income effect, income effect, let's do it this way. Income effect, right now, income. But substitution effect. What's the substitution effect? If you have more able kids, what happens to the rate of return on investments in kids? That increases. That increases because that rate of return, we know, R Y is simply R F of Y, right? If ability goes up by as long as we're making this is strictly positive, let's say that'll go up. Right. So if the rate of return goes up, we want to spend more Y. And that would mean less C. All right? <coughs> So what do we end up with? Uh, I'm, uh, Eric, I'm going to have you sign these different things. Now this is the complete effects. The wage of the child should increase. That increases for both income and substitution effect, right? The right. income effect, you want the kids to have more because you have the utility function, remember? less in their kids. 
and vice versa. Okay? So these are the same sort of effects we had before with other variables like H or P and so on. That, um, <coughs> To the extent you have the uh, uh, income effect of H or P, substitution effect that affects F or Y, then you, you went through the same analysis. Okay? Does anybody have any questions about that? You all see it? Okay. All right. So that is not clear. So that's, I mean, it's not completely unambiguous, but we, we can analyze that problem. Okay. Now that, let's think of it now from an intergenerational perspective. Suppose parents had more ability. Parents. So now we can think of the parental ability. function of human capital for their children, that's the only effect we have is an income effect. We've seen that. If it does enter, we may also have another income effect and a substitution effect. And so we can sign those. That would mean in general, we can show without any ambiguity, higher ability of the parents will raise the human capital and earnings of the kids. That we know will happen. The channels are kind of indirect. It's not directly from the ability so far. It's through the effect on the income and human capital of the parents. And how does that happen? Because their parents, the grandparents, are investing more in them. So you have to think of it, you know, you have the, this well-ordered. You know, what's nice about generations is everything is ordered. You go from older generations, next, older, then first. I mean, you don't have loops. I mean, you can have some loops in terms of transfer pay payments, but basically in terms of the investment process, you don't have loops. Okay, so it's nice. So we know, because the grandparents are invested more and the parents are more able, parents have more income, and they therefore uh, spend more on their kids. That's, in, that's important to understand. Right. But there may also be a direct channel. A direct channel uh, from the parents having higher ability. Okay? What do I mean by a direct channel? Well, it depends what you specify, but I'm going to assume that there's a transmission. Whatever, whether genetic or environmental, I'm not going to try to solve that problem. Um, there's going to be a transmission mechanism. It's going to be, I'm going to assume it's linear, and, and I'm going to write it like this. So the ability of the child, according to this, is equal to some weighted <coughs> average of the average ability, let's say, in, in the society. I'm assuming that stays constant over time. You let that vary. You just have to generalize this a little bit. The average, weighted average, the average ability, the ability of the parents, the weights being this term H, degree of inheritability. Ability. Okay. 
That's the expected value. But in addition, VC is some random determinant of ability of child. Now that random determinant is not directly dependent on the random determinant of the ability of the parents. It may be indirectly dependent because the random determinant on the ability of the parents affects the parents' ability, which then, if H is not zero, affects the ability of the child. So I'm going to assume that VC is independent across generations and independent from one individual to the next. Maybe within a family, among brothers or sisters, brothers and sisters, VC may be correlated. In general, you would think they would be. Okay. So that's the model. So I could have, I said I'm going to assume parents know AC. I, one alternative would say that they know this expected value and they base it on that expected value. Okay. Or they're Bayesians, they initially assume this and then they learn as they get more information about what VC is like. Okay. Could be a way of doing it. But I'm going to take it in that sense. Instead of just assuming the expected value, Assuming they actually know the ability of the child. Okay, they know VC. That's what it amounts to saying. They know VC. Okay? Now we, we come back to our old friend regression to the mean. I'm, I'm going to specify that H, and in particular, it's going to be strictly, I mean, for most purposes, you don't, at, at this corner, things are going to explode a lot, as we'll see, if A is actually equal to 1. Then you get a random walk, and things just, particularly inequality, just keeps going. You can still, I'll make some, I'll show some examples using H equals one. H equals zero means ability is just a random variable in society. It's not family linked. So the right view is that H is somewhere in between zero and one. The children who have smart parents are smarter than average, but they're not quite as smart <coughs> on the average as their parents are. That's regression to the mean. So H is less than 1, greater than 0 means regression to the mean. And for everything that's been measured on that we might call ability like IQ, there's regression to the mean compared to, to child. Uh, scores on tests, there's regression to the mean. I mean, these are the most common factors significant regression to the mean uh, uh, that have been estimated. I mean, a lot of observable characteristics that a lot of regression to mean, like in height, tall parents have tall kids and not quite as tall, right? Um, on the average, shorter parents have shorter kids, but they're not quite as short. There are many exceptions to each of these rules, particularly in height. Height has a very, we know, strong environmental determinant as well. But it's not only environment that uh, people, you know, you see tall families, even in the same society having the same diet. When I say it's environmentally determined important way, you see over time societies get to uh, have been getting taller. The Japanese, for example, at the end of World War II were a lot shorter than the Americans. Now the difference is much smaller as the Japanese diet changed. Okay. Any questions? couple of issues. First of all, we can ask ourselves, what's the equilibrium inequality in ability? By equilibrium inequality, I'm, I'm, I'm going to mean that the variance of the ability of children is equal to the variance of the ability of the parents is equal to some sigma A. And you, you can show if this process is operating over time, you will approach an equilibrium and equality as long as uh, H is not equal to 1. Right. As long as H is strictly, it could be less than 0, as long as it's less than 1. <coughs> we'll see in a moment. So let's assume this. 
So if we assume this is what's going on, and then we say sigma, let me do it, sigma squared A of C is equal to what? Well, H squared, sigma squared A of P plus sigma squared of V, right? I assume this, the variability in V is the same over time, is independent of the, of the ability of the parents, of the, of the parents, so that is the variability in children, VC is independent of A of P, right, so that gives us this. Then if we incorporate the equilibrium condition, this, we can take this over, we get sigma squared A, that's equilibrium, is equal to what? Sigma squared V over 1 minus H squared. So, it, if we look at the inequality and ability, that depends upon the, the inequality in this random term, but also depends, and this is the interesting thing, in an important way, on the degree of inheritability of ability. If, as H gets closer to 1, this inequality explodes. If H equal to 1, there's no equilibrium, it just keeps growing over time. Okay? So high H means you're going to have a lot of inequality and ability. Low H means you may have a lot still, but it'll be determined by the inequality in V, right? 1 over 1 minus H squared is a multiplier on the inequality in V. It's multiplying. It's greater than 1. By multiplying, I mean it's greater than 1 necessarily, as long as we're rest restricting H to be in the interval 0 to 1. Okay? goes to infinity as h goes to uh, 1, and it goes to 1 as h goes to 0. It's between zero, uh, 1 and infinity. All right, so it's a multiplier. So we could have a lot of equilibrium inequality and ability, not simply because there's a lot of randomness in the determinant of ability, but also because there's a lot of inheritability of ability. That's the thing uh, important to see in this equation. We'll show it in earnings too, but uh, it, what's important in this equation is that the inequality at, uh, at a moment in time across different individuals is, is very much related to the inequality over time, that is, to how much stability there is in the ability within a family, and that will apply to other characteristics as well, as we'll see. That's very important to see, that these are not different, I mean, they're not independent measures of inequality, they're related. They're not the same, as we'll say H is not the same as sigma squared A, uh, but H determines sigma squared A, and H determines the degree of transmission of ability over time within a family. Any questions about that? All right, now, so you see, everybody sees it? Eric? Yes, you got it, okay. All right, so what, now what we'd like to do, however, is look at earnings. I mean, that's what we want. When people talk about inequality, they worry a lot about earnings. All right? So if the inequality in ability didn't lead to much inequality in earnings, there wouldn't be that much worry about how much inequality there was in ability. So we want to then link this to a uh, discussion of the determinant earnings. Well, we already built the foundations for that with our, with our analysis. We can say something about the link, right? And therefore, given this transmission mechanism of ability, we have the tools, and simple tools, but theories are simple, uh, to say something about the link to earnings and how ability enters into the determinants of the inequality in earnings, the transmission of earnings across generations. Okay. So, now remember,
Remember, we had two different situations. One where we assumed perfect capital markets, and by that we meant the rate of return, the equilibrium rate of return was the same in different families. And another where that wasn't true and where the income of the family and the ability of the and the human capital of the parents determined where you ended up with. And it wasn't necessarily true that you had the same equilibrium um, a marginal rate of return. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to mainly just develop the analysis in this lecture under the assumption perfect capital markets. Then in the lecture, in, the, in you know, your, your discussion on Thursday, I'd like you to show the equivalent of what, I'm, what I will be showing for the transmission of wages with a perfect capital market under the assumption of uh, less than, you know, not perfect capital market, where you can't borrow at all. And this is something that Tomes and I developed in our paper in the Human Capital and Rise and Fall in Families, and uh, it's, pre it's pretty straightforward to do it um, using the techniques that I'll do for the perfect capital market. Also, I'm going to be assuming for this most of this lecture, <coughs> I'll maybe talk about it if I have time at the end, that the production function for human capital is equal to f of y of c and a of c. Uh, just to simplify, and this, this is easy to take account of, I'm not going to put in the human capital of the parents. You should think about it uh, yourself, though. And more importantly, more important, assume perfect capital market. That is Star is, e uh, is the marginal equilibrium, marginal rate of return. That's the same for all things. Maybe this is the return on physical capital. I'll, we're going to bring in physical capital in the next lecture. Uh, we'll see. But that's in fact what it'll turn out to be. So that's the way you want. If you want, you might think about it that way. Okay. So this is the assumption I'm making. That all these, I mean, you don't have to assume it's equal to physical capital, but all these marginal rates of return are the same in different values. So if we had a picture, picture we might have something like the following. R Y R <coughs> A naught A one Y. So the equilibrium here is Y naught. Y one star, right? All you have to know then to know how much is going to be invested in on, in these under this assumption, all you have to know to know how much each family will invest in their kids is to know the ability of the kid. That's all you need to know. Right? Well and how ability convert like the production function. Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, if I may, let me be a little more precise. You don't have to know anything else about the parents. Right? You, know what the, you have to know what the production function is. That only depends on Y and A, right? And that, and that the result of that line, uh, of the curve there is going to be determined by how rapidly the um, marginal product of Y diminishes, right? And then you have to know something about how uh, the shift in A affects the marginal product, uh, the output of Y. <coughs> Sorry, the output of H. That's all you have to know. Right. Nothing else about the parents. You're assuming that WG is large enough there. What? 
you're assuming that WP is large enough because you may want a wide edge. Well, I'm assuming perfect capital market. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, okay. What does that mean? If WP is low, it means the kids, parents borrow for their kids, and the kids repay later on. So the earning income of kids may well be affected. Uh, so if you come from a poor family, you're going to, and you have the same ability as a kid from a rich family. Let's say two people have this ability, rich, poor. Okay. WP high, WP low. Okay. That's the question you're asking. Both of them are going to invest this amount in Y. What's going to be different? Well, in this case, maybe the parents want to give the kids a bequest, so they'll help them out, make that uh, expenditure for them. In this, in this case, the parents are not rich enough, so they'll maybe spend a little bit of some on their kids, and they'll say, well, I'm gonna, well, we're going to have to borrow the rest for you, and then you're going to repay that when you become an adult out of the fact you're getting higher earnings. You'll be happy with that deal, right? It's a good deal for you. If the parents borrows too much and blows it all on their own consumption, it's not such a good deal. But I mean, from, from what we're saying, it's a good deal for you, right? Um, and so you'll be happy. That could be a, so kids are better off with perfect capital markets, even if the parents borrow for them. And we showed that earlier. So the, but they're both going to have the same earnings. Their incomes will not be the same. I'm only going to deal with the earnings side of it. The incomes will not be the same. Right? <coughs> so if you're in a rich family, you end up generally with a higher income. I mean, unless the government taxes it away from you, you'll end up with a higher income. If parents are richer, you'll, generally you'll be richer. It doesn't mean you'll have bigger earnings in, a, in this perfect outlook. In case you won't, unless your ability is high. Now, we showed that in general, richer people are going to have higher ability. Right. And that will come fully through our analysis. Uh, but in the perfect capital market, all you worry about is the ability, not what the w w richness is. Okay? You see that? And as I said, we could also have H of P in the in this production function, like we had before, we could have H of P in here too. And now that would mean that these, the location of these points would also depend upon H of P, and H of P would shift the location in general of these, of these curves. can write. So the only determinant of the earnings of a child when they're adults, the only determinant of the earnings of a person, let's say, is their ability. Maybe there's some random factor in the labor market, so I'll add that too. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume that relationship is linear, and I'm going to write, it could be log linear, but I'm going to write, earnings of kids is equal to what's my A plus B okay. So epsilon C randomness some so cat in labor market. So in other words, what I'm, 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 I'm allowing now something I haven't allowed before. And be, actually, the analysis would have been easy if I don't have it, but uh, realistic <coughs> have it would be that earnings, let's say, child, or earnings are equal to RH plus E. Some stochastic in terms of okay. Now, B. WC to DAC. It's just a slope, right? Well, we know what that is. That's R times DH of C 
because the expected component is this. This is simply random. And that's equal to R times what? Times H. I'll leave out the C. H of A. Plus, I'm sorry, let me do it a little differently. I mean, this is right what I said here, but I'm, the notation I've usually used is f of a plus f of y dy dA. Right? This we know is positive. This could be either positive or negative. But we know the sum of this thing must be positive, right? Because we know that this must be positive. So in other words, B must be positive. Yeah? Well, I know earnings just depend on ability and not on, on the own capital itself. All right. Good question. Um, they may depend on ability and human capital. But that human capital is in there must is obvious, is, is obvious, right? Let's say you're pretty smart, but you didn't go to school. Well, your, your earnings are going to be affected by that. So human capital has to be in there in any sense. Now you might ask, well, why is an ability directly in there? Ability is in there, but it's in there indirectly through affecting W. Think, think of the following. You're able, okay? Um, the way it affects your earnings in the labor market is you accumulate more human capital. That, that's the model we're assuming. Now, I could add a, an additional term where it also depends directly on ability, right? But a way, in this simple one stock model in the labor market, that's what it is a one stock model of human capital in the labor market. Otherwise, you, you're going to have two, two or more stocks. You're going to have the human capital, and then you're going to have the ability. And you can do that. That, you know, maybe for some examples that, that's relevant. So it's not that ability isn't affecting you, <coughs> but it's doing it through affecting uh, your human capital. We know that effect is always positive. So we know ability does have a positive effect on your expected earnings. That we know. Okay? So I think of the following. An analogy I like to give is the following. You could say let me get the example straight. Think, think of going to college. You could say, well, if I'm more able, um, it takes me a shorter time to pass any test. So that's where my efficiency. Is, right? Shorter time to pass any test. Uh, I'm more efficient in, in that particular way, and that, that's my measure um, of my efficiency is the increased ability to pass a test. On the other hand, you could also say if I'm more able, I mean, I can uh, absorb, uh, I get a higher score on the test. Right? I pass in the same amount of time I get. But I'm assuming something more like the first part. If I'm more able, the way it affects my earning capacity is by affecting my human capital. Not directly. Now, if in fact, if you run an earnings regression, I mean, it's a little tricky, but if you run an earnings regression, you throw in ability, you throw in various measures of human capital, the human capital measures have a much more important effect. The problems of causation and so on, uh, but they have a much more important effect than any measures of ability. On the other hand, if you put in achievement, like AF to, uh, to QT scores, then that will knock out uh, education and other things. But education is a way of producing these AF QT scores. And knock out ability, too, of most of these studies. Okay. So that's what we're assuming. Nothing, I mean, you look worried. There's, there's nothing of principle involved here. I mean, you have a, it just you can have another complicated analysis where ability affects wages, and I have another term here where I have an indirect effect of ability. 
That's all, that's all you would have to do. There's nothing in principle being affected by this. So that's kind of a like, reduced form equation that you just have the effect of ability. Like, P measures the direct, uh, the total effect of ability on wages. Yeah. Like, what, what I'm just a little bit confused about the, the equation, the WC equation. Which one? Uh, this one. This one here? Yeah. So this, this, like me this measures the total effect of ability. Yeah. Total. So it's like a reduced form equation. Essentially, it would be a function of your human capital, but essentially you have like plugged in the, the human capital equation, and then you just have to. Well, it's these two effect. terms. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. That's so exactly I, what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now you can write them out explicitly if you want. To. No, no. It's but it's a sum of those two terms because that gives you the total effect on this. And it's, uh, so. Definitely right. You have to sum up both of the terms of direct effect and the indirect effect through its effect on your, on your investment, which could be negative. The indirect effect could be negative, but the total effect we proved has to be positive. So we, we sign that total effect. That's important. <coughs> okay? may seem trivial that we signed it, but it's important that we know that B is positive. Okay? Any other questions? So, it doesn't hurt to ask questions. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Now you're shaking your head. Are you following everything so far? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if you're not sure, that's the time to ask questions. All right. Um, people ask more questions will learn more. And that's what people, students don't realize. That doesn't mean you should just be asking questions. <laughs> that's an equilibrium result. <laughs> but as an equilibrium, people ask more questions than anyone. Okay. So, but people are hesitant, afraid to ask questions. They think they're going to be embarrassed. I mean, I'm not counting it in any way. So uh, you ask your questions, and, and I think you'll learn more that way. Right. So oh, you have a question. Good. Um, <laughs> we all learn something. Yeah. So, I guess the reason why earlier I was thinking about whether the parent would know the production function for human capital is like, it seems like it would be very difficult for me as a parent to know the optimal amount to invest in my child until he reaches the point where it's the market rate of return. Like, I feel like well, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Well, there is a lot of uncertainty. I'm not, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm taking an abstraction of the parental process. I'm not trying to describe the literal parental process. And what are, what are the things that one has to know? Well, you have to know what are the effects of my, <coughs> say, say I'm a college grad. What's the effects of being a college grad? What I know of my ability for the learning of my kids. I think people might know that one pretty well. Um, you know, there'll be uncertainty about it, you think, but you do a lot of you know, you're accumulating that over from the child that is very young. She may not know if a new a, a, a parent has a first child, newborn infant, won't well, know these things that well. But they'll accumulate by age five and age six. They'll have a lot more information at age one. And then when they have a second child, they'll have more information uh, even more. Okay? So we're assuming they get that information quickly enough so that the investments that are made very early on you'll make within broad limits regardless of what your ability of your child is. That's what I'm assuming. And regardless to a large extent of what how the pro pro production function. Oh, you know, it's within limits only. Second thing you have to know is what your ability of your child is and how that affects uh, their ability to learn. Really, 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 that's what you have to know. What's the ability of them to learn and how you add more to them. That may be hard because as I say, it's hard for parents to have an objective view of the ability of their child. I think that's one of the hardest things for parents to do. And I, I said before, every parent thinks their child is a genius. It's, it's, you go to lab school. It, it, and it's true, they all think they're a genius. Eventually, they learn by the time they're seniors in high school, they learn the limitations of so many kids. So it's hard for parents to accept that their kids have various types of limitations. They learn that. And parents then begin to give their kids better guidance. They say, well, it's crazy for you to think of applying to Harvard. You're not going to get in there. Apply to McAllister or another good school that you could get into, but it's not Harvard. So parents begin to learn that. That's a process. So a more realistic 
discussion of this problem would say, well, to have parents go through that Bayesian or non-Bayesian type of updating process. I don't think it's going to add that much to what we're doing. And I, I think it's a lot easier to look at the end point, assuming they do know. But, you know, in a fuller discussion, you certainly would want to do that. Uh, one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to what extent do you think that that the ability to recognize the returns to, say, going to college is heritable? So, like, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, if you have two parents who never went to college, they would, they might themselves not have a great idea about the returns to college. But if you have, you know, a parent who did go to college, they would have a better... That may well be true. I mean, uh, I think there's some truth to that, that if you had the experience yourself, you know the benefits more than somebody who hasn't had uh, the experience. So it may be um, that parent, you know, now, now a smart parent who didn't go to college, but I'm smart in the following sense, they know they don't know. They would say, well, you know, you have a college advisor at, at, your, at your high school. What do they think you're you're capable of doing. I, uh, do they think you're college material? Or what type of college should you go to? They put more reliance on the information the child would get from their teachers and so on than the information they can give them directly. Right? So they have ways, you know, they don't have to have the knowledge to know where the kids can get the knowledge. And if the kids can get good knowledge that way, then it may be just as good or or even better, the teachers might have a more objective view of what you're capable of than your parents might have. But, I mean, but there is an issue there. You know, that, that issue is discussed in the literature. That why some and uh, kids from lower educational backgrounds don't go on to college. The argument has been that they, you know, they don't know enough. They and their parents don't know enough about what the returns are. On the other hand, you do find when returns go up, generally speaking, kids tend to go on more to college from uh, lower ed educated backgrounds as well as from other backgrounds. You do find that. But maybe for the, some parents, you're not finding it because they don't know. And I'll come later on to this really disturbing feature of the U.S. system is that the fraction who have graduated from high school in the last 30 years has hardly changed. And how to explain that is a challenge. But let's hold that. Yeah. I, I guess I've just been thinking about um, whether having increased ability to assess the knowledge of, or the ability of kids um, would lead to more or less inequality. Because, I mean, on the one hand, if you have really no ability to assess, you know, if you're just basing your ideas, your kids' I mean, abilities, if parents are estimating the ability of their kids rather right. than knowing the ability, is that and, what you're saying? Yeah, and I mean, if, I, I guess if, if you couldn't really tell anything about your kid, your estimate might be sort of based on your own ability. Well, you, right. you, if you knew this transmission equation, right. the, of the ability transmission equation, then you know, your expected estimate on, on the average the kids are going to have a, a, a weighted average of the average ability in the group and your ability. And the weights will be the inherent ability. So if you knew H, uh, <coughs> if you knew A bar, you would have a, a, a starting estimate that might be pretty good. Right. That you might have. Now, of course, uh, you know, some people might argue, well, but parents have biased estimates. They, they assume V is really big. That is, they have, uh, the kids are quite able, uh, relative. and then maybe they learn about them. If they don't learn, then, you, then you'll get a lot of, you know, inefficient types of investments. Too much or too little, depending on how they're assessing it. Yeah. Um, this looks like um, B is, a, is supposed to be a constant. Did I get that wrong? Or how did well, I'm assuming it's a linear equation. It may not be linear, right? I mean, a linear equation is an approximation to the more general equation. So think of this as a, sto a linear stochastic approximation to a more general equation. Maybe it's not linear. Uh, whether it's linear or not will depend upon these, these two terms of f of a constant and is this second term f of y times dy dA constant was, then this would be a, a constant. If not, then you might want to introduce a, 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 you know, some nonlinear term, right? It may vary with the level of A. So this is a, think of this as a first order approximation, maybe a good approximation uh, to a, a more general equation. Okay. Anything else? All right, so One thing 
we can immediately see from this equation here. We, now we can talk about the equilibrium. Equilibrium <coughs> inequality in W. So that would be going to equal y. Well, if the equation was that, it would be v squared times sigma squared a <coughs> plus sigma squared e. That we know right away. And we know what the equilibrium inequality in a is somewhere, but sigma squared v over 1 minus h squared. So this is going to be equal v squared times sigma squared v over 1 minus h squared plus sigma squared v. So this is equilibrium inequality. Purged of, of everything but the Stochastic element that determines ability, the stochastic element that determines earnings. If this is zero, this wouldn't be here. So these are in there, but it's not just these. It's not just the sum of these two things. It depends upon two other parameters. H, the degree of inheritability, and B, the production technology. Right? Which is what we're talking about. So B, we see what B is. That's determined by the production technology. <coughs> And uh, if, if B is large and H is large, just, you, you're really multiplying up greatly the inequality in the, uh, a bit, uh, in the random determinant of ability. You multiply that up a lot. On the other hand, if B is very low, that uh, the m marginal effect of Y declines very rapidly as you increase y, and increase in ability has very little effect on f. The b is, b is small, and that will lower it all. So these are the production function enters into the equilibrium inequality, and the intergenerational degree of transmission, h, <coughs> enters into the equilibrium degree of inequality. In a very simple way. Okay. What? What's your question? I was just wondering. Um, why A in your uh, wealth of children equation is a constant, but why there's not a population variation in that? Why the average ability? A bar. It's A bar. It's a constant. I'm assuming it's a constant. So when we go back, you mean a little A here? Yeah. Well, I'm assuming is it a, it's a linear approximation. I mean, maybe it isn't. But, I mean, uh, I'm... It is the same question that he had. I just assume it's a linear approximation. So little a is uh, in his linear equation is uh, is determined. You have a more general uh, uh, function, maybe, and so you take a linear approximation, a more general function. You'll have some a term, and, and you'll have some b term, right? Maybe the relationship was really something like this: w c over a of c. And it's not linear, and we're approximated maybe around that point. So A is going to be really, this will be A, and this will be B. Right? And around this point, it'd be a poor approximation if we get back on us around the extremes. The thing is, it's fun is that A and B can vary in the, in the population. And then when you take the variance, you should also consider the variance of little A and little B. Well, it depends. I'm not, I mean, in terms of what we have so far, there are no variables. I mean, if the f function vary in the population, we, we've been assuming the same f function for everybody, right? So if the f function was the same for everybody in the population, then everybody would have an equation, everybody's transmission of personal mobility would be the same, Everybody's solution from here would be the same. 
No, but f y can differ, right? Well, it could there. differ. I'm just saying the f function was the same. No, but even if the f function is the same, the derivative could differ because of different levels of. Well, but the equilibrium, in equilibrium, this is at round the at the equilibrium point. The equilibrium would be the same for everybody, right? If at this point f y. Everybody had, this is FY, I mean, this is RFY. So everybody would have this FY around their equilibrium point. Now, I mean, this is, remember, this is a, this is a linear approximation. It's a derivative. It's, it's a linear approximation to the change in H. Now, if you, if you went to discrete changes in H, now, that may not apply. That's why this function may not be linear in general. It may not be linear, right? It may be something like, like this function. So this is the, I mean, it may not be concave, but this may not be linear. And I draw it not linear. So you're approximating. And I'm just assuming a linear approximation is a good approximation for our purposes makes a, a problem a lot easier. I don't think there's any matter of principle involved in here. It's a question, or well, if you deal with a nonlinear approximation, a lot of these formulas are going to be more complicated. Okay. All right, so we, 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 we look at the, the main point I want to stress here, not, not the linearity so much. I mean, that's just an approximation. But that the equilibrium inequality is going to be determined not surprisingly by how much inequality there is in the luck in the labor market and the luck in the ability market, but also on the optimization. And also it's going to be determined by the degree of inheritability of H, maybe, uh, that's just given. Uh, but also on the optimization. The optimization process determines B. So that enters into this. It's not just completely mechanical. Uh, if people aren't optimizing, as some of you were discussing, and then the B would be different. So op the optimization is built into this. Now, exactly what B is depends on we'd have to make some assumptions or estimates of what the F function is like. Right? But we're building in optimization into our, our analysis. It's not simply a, me a, a mechanical uh, De uh, derivation of e inequality. It depends upon so the assumption that families are optimizing. And we were able to assume, given that families are optimizing, that B must be positive. If we didn't as as have optimization, B could be negative. Who knows? I mean, give me a model and I'll tell you what B is, right? But uh, so optimization, it, it, it gives us an important restriction. Okay? That slope at all these points is going to be positive. I don't know if it's concave, I don't know if it's convex, but the slope at all these points is going to be positive. Now, that, that's the problem. All right. Now, if we knew, if we could directly measure ability, we'd be finished. We don't have to go any further. We'd estimate an equation like this. And for those of you who are disturbed by the fact that it's linear, I'll put in some A squared and I'll have some general polynomial here. And I'd estimate it. And you tell me how complicated it is, I'll have some infinite polynomial that we know approximates any function. Okay? So I'd estimate that directly. Okay? And that would be the way you'd want to do it. The problem is we don't have such reliable measures of ability. There's work going, and, and, and ability in terms of what are the determinants of earning power. There are different types of ability. And it's, it's a vector and all, all that. But which ones are important? Is it more important to have a high IQ or to finish your work on time? Well, it's better to have both, right? But there's a trade-off. If you have a high IQ, but you can't stay with a problem, you shift around from one problem to the next, you never get anything done, and you, you don't achieve a lot. And there are, I mean, I, everybody knows, I've known a lot of high IQ people who never achieved a lot because they didn't have some of these other traits. On the other hand, you know, I, I, one also knows, and I certainly have known, a lot of not so high IQ people who 
have been very distinguished economists. <laughs> I mean, it's true. I mean, it's because they're different ability. Some people think deeply about a problem. You know, they're not quick. Uh, they're at a seminar. It takes them a half hour to see something. But they think deeply, and they've made a, they make important contributions. And some very famous economists would be in that category. While other economists are really quick, they seem brilliant, and they don't, they, they're just not able to do anything. Right? So there are a lot of different types of abilities that matter in, in particular. We, we have a very you know, simplified ideal form, but even with that simplified form, we don't know what to put in to this equation. So, we can't do that, or at least it's much harder to do. The question is, or maybe, uh, well, and there's a reason why what most studies have done that have looked at intergenerational is to not do this equation, which looks directly on the ability of the children, or even the ability of their parents, but looks at the earnings of the parents. Right? Tries to link the earnings of the parents to the earnings of the children. And the question is, can we do that in our analysis? And what does it say? So suppose we had another equ linear equation, okay, a linear approximation. to think of everything as law. I'm just writing linear in, in the actual value. But for a lot of these problems, logs give you, or semi-logs give you a better fit. Plus, okay, yeah. So what did I have that? What determines beta? It should be intuitively clear that beta and the functional form. But I mean, it's a measure of the elasticity, I right, know, of the change in the... Well, it's a, it's a slope, but... Um, well, yeah. I mean, it's a slope, that's all right. I mean, you can get an elasticity once you know the slope. But, so what determines it? The altruism, uh, the F function... The concavity. Right? Concavity. Okay. What do you think? Beta works through the investment of parents into the human capital of their kids. So it's going to determine by F? Yeah, and, and, and by how responsive YC is with respect to All right. parental income. Suppose H was zero. Like little h? Little h is zero. What would beta be? By little h being zero, We have in this equation if little h is zero, this is one, that the ability of children is just the ability, the average ability plus some random variable. Are we still in a world where there is like perfect capital market? Yeah. Then it well, would be zero, right? Beta would be zero. 
Why, why would it be zero? Because parental earnings wouldn't make any difference to what your earnings are because your ability is only determined by your luck in the ability market, unrelated to what your parents' ability is, right? That's going to determine your earnings. And therefore, in that case, H equals zero implies beta equals zero, regardless of the degree of altruism and everything else. Maybe that's a special case. Suppose H is 1. So in that case, the ability of your kid is just the ability of your parent plus some random variable. generational mobility. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what it says. It doesn't depend on parental income. Right. Supposing now H is 1. So in the case H is 0, we have perfect intergenerational mobility because we have perfect capital markets and all that. Well, think of it this way. WP is determined by A of P, right, up to the luck of parents. So WC then equals WP except for the luck of parents and the luck of children. So in, that, in this case, also it's going to imply that beta is equal to 1. So in general, we would guess from this, in general, beta equals H. Regardless of all the other things in the problem, that affects the level of wages. Now we're talking about the intergenerational movement. And how would we derive that? Well, here's a way to look at this. Let's go back. Here's this equation. Now, A of C, that's what's A of C? Well, we know what that is. A of C is 1 minus H A of P plus H A of A bar plus V of C. Okay, so we can factor this. Combine term. Constant term now. Plus B, uh, now we're getting a little trouble. B H A of P, right? Plus B B of C, right? All right. But we know a, what's A of P. Well, we can go back to the parental equation version of that, that W of parents is equal to A plus B. A of parents plus E of parents. So let's substitute for A of P. And we would get this term here plus BH times what? Well, A of P is WP minus A minus E of P over B plus B V C. drop out. Okay? What do we end up with? What do we end up with? We end up with some WC is equal to some constant, cap C, which is equal to A plus B times 1 minus H A bar plus we have something else here, minus A of H That's some constant C equal to. Then it's equal to plus H W P. H W P 
And then we have plus B, V, C minus H, E of P. So, what we have here levels of earnings, but doesn't affect the transmission equation in terms of the uh, coefficient on parental earnings. That's important to see. Okay. We know what the constant is. The constant is equal to 1 minus h times what? a plus b a bar, that's c. And this, the residual term, z of children, is equal to, that's a little more complicated, dv of c, that's okay, plus epsilon of c, but minus h epsilon of p. Okay? So it depends not only on the innovations in the children's ability and earnings, but also in the parental earnings. If this was zero, this complication wouldn't be here. We would just have B, V of C. If we just had a, <coughs> have the equation we've been dealing with most of the time, that earnings is equal to R times human capital, we wouldn't have to worry about that. Right? But I put it in now because it does affect, if you wanted it, if you look at this equation, look at this equation. Now it's a linear equation. Right? It's a linear equation because this is constant. This term is constant. Depends upon the H parameter, the A parameter, and the productivity coefficient as well as A bar. H, this is constant, and equal to H. This is not independent of WP. Right? Why? Because epsilon P is positively related to WP, right? Earnings are positively related to the random term in your earnings equation. So if you just did a least squared estimate, you would be biasing the coefficient on WP uh, P down. So you'd, you'd have to instrument. Maybe you'd instrument with the earnings of the brothers if they're in the, their shocks are independent of each other, the earnings of the grandparents. You'd, you'd instrument it, and people have done things like that. Okay. Or maybe you try to average over many years' earnings, so you average out a lot of the effects of the EFP. But, the, I mean, that's an econometric, important point for the econometrics of it. But from the analytics of what's going on, it's a detail. Uh, the main thing that's going on here is that a lot of the, the effects of the productivity and so on, the altruism and all that, in this perfect capital market case, wa washes out. And that really what's determining the intergenerational mobility is the intergenerational mobility of ability. Right. Now these other coefficients enter into your random term uh, and, uh, and, and a bunch of other, uh, other factors. And we took this simplest case where there's no luck in the labor market, everything is nice and neat. And if there's no luck in the labor market, this is zero. This is zero, and all we have is a linear equation with the luck in the abilities market multiplied, interestingly, by the productivity factor, right? The optimization factor, but it's still just the luck in the labor market. Luck in the luck in the ability market. Luck in the labor market makes it a little more complicated because you introduce some effect. Yes. So, 
in all of this, we're looking at intergenerational earnings differences. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it seems like the I don't know. I would have thought what we would care more about is wealth differences. And it seems like altruism and all of those things might they affect, certainly will affect, affect wealth. the wealth. Yeah, not I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Be, no, of course they will affect wealth. We've shown that they will affect wealth. The poor kids might have to borrow and pay it back. Uh, the parents are giving bequests. They will affect wealth. But if you look at all the intergenerational regressions that are done, you know, they're mainly done with earnings. I mean, you can do a one on income, you can do one on wealth, and that's important to do as well. So I'm saying if you try to interpret the intergenerational estimates on earnings, if you have this sort of world, then you would expect the coefficient of parental earnings to reproduce the degree of inheritability of ability. Right. Whatever determines that degree of inheritability. And therefore, if you look at estimates that say, um, if you do this regression, that the coefficient beta is 0 0.6, 0 0.7, then it can suggest one or two things. Either there's a high degree of inheritability, or you'd say, but cap the capital market is not perfection assumption is not is not valid. So the, the question would now be, how do you extend this analysis when you don't assume perfect capital markets? Well, it's and this is what Dan is going to work through. But it's it's clear in principle what you'd want to do, and it, you come out with a more complicated version of this. No longer this, but more complicated. Then what you want to do, you want to say, well, the earnings are going to depend on the ability of the kid and the earnings of their parents. Okay? Then go through the same sort of process I went through with that equation and, oh, and see what you get. And then Dan will do that in, in class. And it turns out that now you're going to have a three generational equ wage equation where parental wages. And grandparents' wages are in there, and grandparents' wages enter with a negative sign. So the higher your grandparents' earnings are, the lower your, earnings, your grandchildren's earnings are. Does that make sense, Eric? I mean, that's that's holding all of the other uh, all of the other factors fixed, such as uh, ability. Well, but that's all the it's all the equation stuff. We're assuming this ability process is working. But you get you're getting there. I'm not yeah. going to give you the, the answer. You're getting there. It's certain. It would be stupid if it something would be wrong if we said the higher your grandparents' earnings are, the lower yours are. Right. I mean, that would make no sense in the in, in the optimizing world that we live in, and it's not right. It isn't true. There is a positive connection. But you do get a negative coefficient. The question is why? And why don't you work that through? Yeah. But your whole, your whole parental earnings fixed, right? So essentially yeah. higher grandparents earning means that your parents have lower ability. That's right? a crucial That's factor, right? That's a crucial factor. That there's a partial coefficient, and uh, the only way you can hold parental income constant when, parent, when grandparents have higher earnings is that something's offsetting the parental earning generation. And that offset is what produces a negative coefficient. All right. So why don't you work that through and, we'll, and we'll go over it. The other thing you should work through, as I mentioned, is putting human capital of parents in the production function for the human capital of kids. That's really easy to work through. Not, not we did some of that in last week's class. You did? Um, yeah, doing some of the comparison. In the intergenerational, but did you, uh, uh, what about the intergenerational? No, the intergenerational. Now, I want to do it all, only in the intergenerational, okay? All right.